Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Neil Bawa. I'm um, one of your two organizers for this webinar. And um, I work for Financial Attunement. You can see my picture up there on the top right. It's uh, 4.03 p.m., so we'd like to get started. Um, I'm on the Pacific Coast. I'm in uh, San Francisco, uh, based on the time zone you can tell. I'd also like to introduce you to my fellow organizer, Karen Hodges. She's from uh, Next Generation Trust. Karen? Hi, how are you? Welcome, Fantastic. everybody. Um, so we'd like to... Uh, you to this event. We have a lot of content to go over, so I'm going to jump right into it. Before I do, I want to let you know that it's perfectly okay to ask questions throughout the presentation. On my side, I have a question box that's up and it flashes, so whenever you type in a question, I'll respond. I actually like it being interactive, so it's not necessary for you to keep your questions until the end. Whenever you come up with questions, just go ahead and type them into the question box, and I will answer them as I go. So welcome to Multifamily Fundamentals. This is a one-hour presentation, maybe a little less, on, on basically the fundamentals of multifamily investing. So uh, important disclaimer, let's start with that. We're not investment advisors, so this is an educational webinar. I also know that all investments have some degree of risk, so be aware of your risk tolerance level. Um, also understand that you should be researching beyond this event prior to investing any money with anyone, not just, not just us. Um, also, um, any recommendation that you're free to accept or reject is really not a guarantee of successful performance, so be aware of that. And please do not invest your money based on our recommendation alone. Do your research. All right, so here's our goal for today. Uh, we're going to start with the big why and the big how. Why is multifamily a great investment for you, and how can you get into it? Uh, we're going to introduce you to the two plus trillion dollar, that's, that's right, that's two thousand billion dollar U.S. multifamily market. We're going to talk about the very latest market trends that have been driving multifamily growth for the last five or six years. And then we're going to explain how groups of investors buy multifamily properties together. We're then going to give you the top reasons to invest in multifamily, and um, there's a lot of them, so I'm just going to give you a small number of those. Um, let me get a laser pointer here. There we go, laser pointer. And we're going to go through the life cycle of a multifamily project. And I'm going to do this very quickly because we have limited time, but I hope to get through the entire life cycle with you. So let's start with the big why and the how. And the big why is really, why can you not afford to only invest in stocks and bonds? So we're going to go through for the next five minutes or so why you need to diversify beside, beyond stocks and bonds. and also why you must seek higher yields, though you have to do it safely, it's extremely important to understand why higher yields are necessary. We're also going to talk about why stock experts these days are promoting real estate. Um, and this is an, a recent anecdote. I, I went to a conference where there's, there was this guy that had been pushing, real, uh, pushing stocks for the last 20 years. So I went into his breakout session, and I really expected him to be talking about one stock strategy or the other. To my absolute shock, he was promoting multifamily real estate. And I asked him about it, and he said, well, you know, just, just look at the numbers over the last, you know, decade or so. It's become very difficult for me to, to promote, you know, stocks, and my investors are not happy, so I'm promoting real estate, which was, you know, was shocking for me, given how much this guy knew about stocks. So very interesting that this is happening, and it's happening more and more. And then... After the three big whys, we're going to talk about the how. How can you invest in real estate passively without managing, without doing rehab, and without doing flips? All of those, as many of you are now aware, thanks to wonderful TV shows, are not passive. So rehab works. Rehab makes a lot of money. Rehab is also a tremendous amount of work. So, so thankfully, these shows are making it obvious as to how these are not passive real estate investments. They're just real estate investments. So let's start. So the big why, right? We talked about it right here. Why can you not afford to only invest in stocks and bonds, and why must you seek higher yields? Well, let's look at that first. The answer is really staring us in the face. America's social security system and retirement planning system was designed for a different reality. And there are three reasons for this, and here's the first reason. The big one is life expectancy. If you think about it, in 1900, 
your great grandfather worked until the day he died because average age expectancy was 49. In 1960, your grandfather or your grandmother, well, their retirement had to last a couple of years because life expectancy was 69 years. Now it's 79 years, much higher than that for women, and rising fast. So at this point, your retirement has to last decades. But keep in mind that the U.S. social security system was designed right about this time frame. So it was never really designed for this reality. It was never designed for people to live so long, which is why the system is out of whack and it doesn't really function properly for an effective retirement. So let's move on to the next item, the next reason. The second reason is healthcare costs are rising much faster than inflation. And when you look at the, the retirement income that you're going to have, you have to keep this in mind. This is how much faster. So wages, 16% over this time frame. Um, the, the GDP of the US, 168%. National health expenditures, 818%. Also keep in mind that most of this hits you in the final two decades of life. In fact, I've, I've seen numbers that show that healthcare expenses, 70 to 80% of your lifetime healthcare expenses are going to come in the, in the final decade or decade and a half. So keep that in mind when you're looking at retirement income and the number of dollars that you're going to need. Here's a third one. This one's my favorite, especially because of what's happening in the stock market right now. Stock market returns adjusted for inflation, I'm going to say this again, adjusted for inflation are really just too low to get ahead. And here's an example. What's the actual annual growth over the last 14 years when you adjust it for inflation in a stock market? So. Starting Jan 1st, 2001, all the way to the end of last year, and you know that it's going to be much worse if I, if I add 2015, if I adjust for inflation and include dividends, the true annualized returns for stocks has been 2.99%. Here's the source for this calculator. It's a well-known calculator. So if you invested a dollar in 2001, it's now $1.51. How do you really expect this to grow to a reasonable sum that's sufficient for you to retire without having a job? It's simply impossible with the sort of returns that the stock market's been returning for the last 15 years. And this year, as I mentioned, this 2.99 is going to go down, not up. So I, I chose not to include a partial leader. So really, what do you need to do to get ahead? Well, number one, you need to understand the magic of compounding. So once your money is invested, keep it investing, reinvest it, and then add investments with potentially higher yields to your portfolio. And we'll show you, you know, multifamily is one example, but there's others as well. So here's some very interesting math that shows the astonishing difference when, that when you compare low yield investments to high yield investments. So here's an example. If you invest $100 for 30 years at three different levels of returns, what do you end up with? Well, if you do 2% returns, you end up with $182 after 30 years. So your 100 bucks has grown to 182. If you do this at 10% returns, you've got a reasonable return. The 100 bucks has now turned into nearly 2,000. If you invested at 18%, that $100 becomes $21,000. That's just how astonishing the, the, the process of compounding is. So you would think, and this is counterintuitive, most people if they were to draw a graph would think that it goes like this. Well, it's not like that. This is an exponential return graph. So it goes like this. It looks a little bit like a hockey puck, right? That's why it's really important to push for higher yield. And, and I, I understand that the green bar will probably have much higher risk than the, the, the blue bar, but that's why you mix investments. You don't want to have all of your investments here. You don't want to have all of them here. You want to have a mix of the green, the orange, and the blue bars. Now, if you flip this around, right, and look at it from the end goal in mind, if you want to have $15,000 per month in passive income 20 years from now, and keep in mind this may look like a big number, but you've got to adjust for inflation, well then, how much do you need to save every month? Well, at 2%, believe it or not, you need to save $30,000 a month. You need about $9 million at 2% to make $15,000 a month. So you need to be saving 30 grand a month, which is a shocking number. Most people can't do that. At 10% returns, it's more reasonable. You need to save 2,370, but still, this is a very difficult number for most people to save. At 
you're now down to $400 a month that you need to save to have this much in passive income. Once again, this is a exponential hockey puck graph. I've flipped it around so you get a visual on the amount of money that needs to be saved at higher returns. So I hope I've proven my first point, which is why do you need to focus on a mix of lower and higher yields? Higher yields have an incredible impact on your portfolio. Keep in mind that 18% is nine times higher than 2%, but $433 a month is 170th of this number. It's counterintuitive, but it's very important that you realize what higher yields do. So now, let's move on to what financial attunement does. Well, what we do, and that's my picture on the left and John Martellando, my partner on the right, um, we're passionate about having your assets work for you and, and really fine-tuning your thinking about capital investing. And I hope I did a little bit of that in the, in the last five or six minutes, showing you how, why high yields matter so much. So what we do is we buy and manage multifamily complexes nationwide. Both of us have been in real estate for a while. John Mark's been doing it for 32 years, so I can't say I, I can match that. Um, in my own time, I've purchased single families, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, sevenplexes, and I've invested in multifamily syndications in Texas, Kansas, Florida, um, and, uh, and now in Illinois. So we've been doing multifamily for a while. We understand large multifamily complexes, and we think that they offer some of those high yields that we're talking about. This is where we currently own properties in California, Texas, Oklahoma. Our current property, the, the one that we are currently working on, is happens to be in Chicago. So our biggest competency is really in asset selection and management. That's what we do, and that's why we, we believe we're able to, to uh, provide some of the returns. We have decades of real estate experience between the two of us, but really the biggest benefit that John Mark and I have is multifamily. Multifamily by itself is an incredibly good asset class. So for the rest of this event, I'm just going to talk about multifamily and the benefits that we have of investing in this amazing asset class. So let's, let's get started. So what does the term multifamily mean? Well, it doesn't mean two or more. And, and I guess that's a common sense definition, but really when we look at multifamily, we mean five or more. And a true multifamily that reaches scale at 150 units or more. Now, why five? Because one to four units are treated mostly as single family and you get residential loans, which means that they look at your credit. The moment you look, go beyond four, they don't look at your credit. Why? Because they don't value multifamilies based on your credit. Multifamily is valued based on income, the net operating income of the property. It is not based on comparables. For example, you could have two properties. They're next to each other. They're the same size. They were built on the same day. They're in exactly the same condition. One of them could be worth twice as much as the other in multifamily. Why? Well, because that one is better run and has double the net operating income. So this is a very important concept. And this slide is the true magic of multifamily. This, this is something that single family can never do. Here's an example. In a 200 unit complex, the management successfully raises rents by $25 a unit. That's all they did, $25 a unit. Instantly and immediately, the value of the property goes up by $750,000. All the time, every time. Here's why. 200 units multiplied by $25 a month, multiplied by 12 months a year, at an 8% cap rate. I won't go into cap rate in this particular uh, webinar, but this is a fairly standard cap rate. If I do this math, the number that I come up with is $750,000. That's how much the value increases. Now, in a, in a place like San Francisco, this number might be a million and a half on the same $25 increase, but that's not standard. Eight caps are fairly standard in the US for, for the kind of class property that we are buying. So huge, huge increase in net uh, value of the property just based on a very small increase in rent. Cannot do that in single family. So let's talk about who manages a multifamily property. Run by professional property managers, full-time leasing agents, full-time maintenance staff. Everybody works in the property. They're not contractors. They're fully accountable for their time. 
Investors are not involved in tenants and toilets. Managers, such as me, we're not involved in tenants and toilets either. It's the property management team that does that. Sales, cost, and profit metrics are used to run each property like any other business. And I'm going to emphasize this later in the presentation. Multifamily is different from single family because it's a business. And all multifamily properties, especially the large ones, are run based on sales, cost, and profit metrics. That's what we focus on. If a property manager is not able to maintain sales, cost, and profit metrics equivalent to what the other property managers are doing in the area, they will not have their job. We will fire them and, and find somebody else that can do it. So about loans. We talked about value, right? Well, loans are also based on the property's operating income and occupancy, not on your income or credit. So if it's empty, it's worthless. Nobody will give you a loan against it. If it's full at 100%, you'll get a very lucrative, very low, low interest rate loan. So why is this important? Well, lenders scrutinize, scrutinize each property in great detail, helping protect investors. So this, this, you get a benefit out of this as an investor because the lender is not going to lend against a property that's not doing well. Uh, is, you know, for example, um, well, let me, let me bring that example up later, but I, I hope I got this point across. Lenders protect you for multifamily loans. In the multifamily market, there are none of these silly 3% down FHA loans. Those things don't exist. At, in, in, in most cases, you cannot get more than 80% loan to value because lenders simply don't want to take risks. So what do we focus on for, for multifamily? Well, we focus on two things. One is cash flow. Multifamily doesn't mean anything without cash flow. There's lots and lots of single families where people have no cash flow. They're just hoping for appreciations. We don't play that game with multifamily at all. It's all about cash flow, and it's about value addition. Well, what does that mean? Value addition means you take an asset that's not running well, and you raise its income, either by evicting tenants that are not paying or bringing in uh, new tenants at a, at a higher rent rate or reducing the delinquency or a combination of all of these. Well, when you raise the value, you instantly and immediately raise the net profit, which instantly and immediately raises the value of the property. So there are many, many examples, not from us, from many other good syndicators, where they will take a property and double its value in a single year. And how did they do it? Well, they doubled the income, and then they sell it instead of holding on to it. So that's the game of multifamily, value addition and cash flow. That's what we look for. So sometimes you focus on the cash flow. So you, sometimes you'll find deals where the cash flow is, is great. Well, there's not going to be a lot of appreciation or value add on those properties because that's already been squeezed out by whoever sold it to you. In certain cases, though, the cash flow is much lower than the market. Well, then we have to go there and investigate to see what's wrong. Is it delinquency? Is the property manager not doing a good job? And if we can raise the income, we can immediately raise the value. And that's, that's what we do at Financial Attunement. We look for properties that are mismanaged. Now, how do we find these properties and where are these properties? Well, that really depends. It depends on market cycles. You know, real estate has predictable market cycles and it creates identifiable emerging markets and multifamily investors we know how to read these cycles and we time our investments accordingly to enter and exit markets here's an example these are the phases of the market right now I can tell you that Chicago is somewhere in in this area here it started rising about six months ago Dallas is somewhere here it still has a ways to go but it's probably in the sixth inning San Francisco is on the bottom of the ninth inning. So that's a perfect example of how you can have markets at different levels. Sacramento, which is 100 miles from San Francisco, is probably right about here. So we know this because these there's a, a wide variety of methods that we use to determine whether a property is buyer's market two, seller's market one, or seller's market two. In, in most cases, we like to buy between these two. But we usually will not buy if we are convinced it's here. We want to see signs of it going up before we buy. It's much better to buy right here than to buy here and, and discover that it's going to you know, keep, keep dipping again. So these real estate market cycles are incredibly useful because it, at any point in the U.S., we've got 20, 30 emerging markets that we can go after. So how long is an investment for? 
two to seven years are common, this is not a fix and flip business. Investors have to be prepared to invest for that time frame. People ask me, what are the downsides of multifamily? Well, the big downside is you're investing for a certain time frame, and during that time, you don't have access to your money. So keep that in mind. Why are multifamily values generally less volatile than single family? Well, multifamily doesn't suffer from those huge swings that, that re single family goes through. Simply because on the upside, we, our values are not based on comps. They're not based on comparables. So just because there's a multifamily over in that corner that, that is valued at 10 million doesn't mean my multifamily is worth 10 million. I have to have the right amount of profit. So, so they tend not to go up as fast. And on the other side, when real estate, you know, single family crashes, it tends to have very deep craters. Multifamily doesn't go through that. So the, the cycles are much smoother. They're not very zigzaggy, up and down sort of cycles that, that happen. And the big part is people still need a place to live during recessions. And keep in mind, when a recession happens, a lot of people have to move from single families because they can't afford their mortgage or much higher rent. Those people move. And where do they move to? They move to apartment complexes. So we have a built-in benefit during recessions. So here's classes of multifamily buildings. Class A, well, downtown San Francisco, affluent tenants, above average rents, newer buildings, great finishes, the hardwood floors and the, and the steel appliances and the granite countertops, all that sort of stuff, but a downside for investors. Usually have low cash flow and upside. Now, in the long run, they tend to have a very good upside. They tend to appreciate more than any other class but they do have a darker side. Their cash flow is very sensitive to recessions. During recessions, a lot of A renters, they move to B or they move to C. So B is basically a wide range of users. Bit older than class A, finishes fair to good, some deferred maintenance, adequate amenities. So the three that are most popular are tennis courts, pools, and gyms. So they have better ca cash flow than class A, um, there's a mix of institutional buyers, uh, pension funds, and also some private buyers. But overall, their monthly cash flow is not as high as C's. The, pe the reason people like C's is because they have the highest cash flow. Typically, more than 20 years old, often need some kind of renovation, and also a higher level of mismanagement because a lot of C's are purchased by individual owners that don't do a very professional job of managing them. So very often, our opportunity is when we see individual owners mismanaging their properties. So you get the highest cash flow and the greatest upside at the beginning, but A's and B's are going to appreciate more in the long run. So if you hold an A for 10 years, it's going to appreciate quite a bit more than a B or a C. There's also D's, which I define as don't buy, and those are in war zones. So they're not our market. So I'm going to talk a little bit about multifamily trends. What's really driving the growth in multifamily? And the first one, probably the biggest one, is a fundamental change is taking place across America. Rent is the new buy. Americans are now preferring to rent, and I'll show you some of the statistics around it, and they're pretty shocking. And these statistics come from Appfolio and the Wall Street Journal. So only half of all renters said they anticipate becoming homeowners in the next five years, and that number is the lowest it's ever been. Renters are also more committed to renting than they've ever been. So for example, um, one in five apartment dwellers and one in four individual property dwellers, people renting single families, plan to stay where they're living for five years or more. Once again, this number is much higher than it's ever been. Also, even if they qualify for mortgages, they're not buying. Less than one-third of renters cited the inability to obtain a mortgage as the reason for not becoming homeowners. So they're staying renters by choice. Why? Because they like the freedom of the renting lifestyle. They know they're being priced out of areas that have good schools or safe neighborhoods or parks and playgrounds or community centers, or they just like the place. They like the people there. Well, they can either go to C's or D's or war zones or they can live in these nice places and rent. And that's why we're, we're seeing 
much quicker rental price increases than we've seen in the past. For example, we've seen 4.6% increase last year, where in the past, typical increases were in the 2% range. Now, because there's, there's reducing inventory for apartments, rents are going up quicker. Now, here's another big one. Millennials are not buying homes at the same rate as previous generations. And notice here that this, this generation, the 18 to 34 year olds, they were buying at roughly 17.5% in 2005. 17.5% of them had owned homes. This started declining before the recession. It started declining in 2005, and since then it's been falling. In 2015, it continues to fall and has now dropped below 13%. This is bad news for America. A lot of people are not buying. It is very good news for multifamily apartment investors. So I, I don't like this trend because it's, it's bad for our country, but at the same time, if you're investing in multifamily, it's a terrific trend. So the last piece is you've got 75 million baby boomers. A whole bunch of them are looking to downsize. And instead of downsizing to smaller homes, there's a trend for them to go into urban apartments. Maybe they're moving closer to their kids, maybe they like the convenient services, but these echo boomers seem to be moving to apartments in urban places instead of buying smaller homes. And that's a very, very important trend that's good for multifamily. So as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, and we think that multifamily has a decade-long runway in front of it. So now we can show you some of the <coughs> ways you can benefit from, from the trend. So how groups of investors buy multifamily complexes, let's explain that. Well, they buy it through this concept known as syndication, right? They're expensive, so a bunch of people get together and use a mechanism called syndication. And the rules of syndication are governed by the SEC, so investors are protected. It's, it, it, syndication has to be done in a particular fashion. We can't just do it willy-nilly. We have to follow a bunch of rules. So how do investors invest in multifamily projects? Well, an experienced team finds an asset to purchase, then offers the opportunity to their pre-screen investors who can participate or not. And then individuals can participate, self-directed IRA plans can participate, um, and entities can invest varying amounts, and they get a proportional equity share. So somebody who invests $50,000 will get half the cash flow and value gain of somebody that invests $100,000, so it's very proportional. Now the team finds the property, contracts it, performs all the due diligence, organizes the offering, finds the funds, and they manage the property until it's sold. So to do that, they receive a share of both cash flow and profits, usually a 70-30 split. If it's a class B, it tends to be a 20-80 split. If it's a class C, it tends to be a 70-30 because class Cs have much higher cash flow. So management of the property. Um, the team usually assigns an asset manager who lives in that city. For example, we have a property in Chicago right now, and our asset manager is someone who's managed rental properties in Chicago for over 10 years. And then we also assign a property management company, and these people work, they assign four to five employees at the property full-time. Those are people that are full-time employees, not contractors. So as before, no tenants or toilets. Cash flows are typically dispersed quarterly to investors who often reserve, receive preferred returns before the management team is paid. So it's a, it's a performance-based system where if we don't perform, the investors get paid, the management team does not. But if we perform, then both of us get paid. So why invest in multifamily? Well, I showed you a bunch of really powerful trends. But what if those trends vanish? Those trends have been around for the last five years. We think they're gonna be around for the next 10. But what if they weren't there? Why have people been investing in multifamily for the last 100 years, right? Well, those, because these are things that are always there. Number one, cash flow. If there's no cash flow, we don't buy. Multifamily investing is very, very, very focused on cash flow. So the exact return will depend, but double-digit annual returns are common. Actually, I'm gonna go uh, beyond that and say they're very common. And when I, when I mean double-digit returns, I do not mean the double-digit returns that you have to share with the management team. 
I mean double digit net returns to you. Top reasons to invest in multifamily. Forced appreciation. Remember that slide where I talked about how for a 200 unit, if you grow the, uh, the numbers by $25 per unit in rent per month, the property appreciates by $750,000? Well, that's what we're talking about. If you double the profit, you double the value instantly. You don't have to wait two years, five years, or 10 years. The market doesn't have to be going up. It doesn't even have to be going sideways. You could have a market that's going downwards, but because you double the, the, the profit, the value of the property doubles or close to doubles. So that's, that's the big difference. Now keep in mind that you probably can get bigger benefits and bigger profits with distressed properties. Why? Because you're getting a discount on the value of purchase, but you're also taking the risk that the property management team, the asset management team, will be able to successfully turn it around. So make sure that when you're working with, with people on multifamily, only work with people that have a lot of experience and a good track record. This is my favorite reason. I, you know, for 17 years, I managed a business, and I was tied to professional management, to metrics. So what the asset management and property management teams do is they set a bunch of sales, cost, and profit metrics, and they run the property according to it, and they use their software tools to determine what those metrics should be for their geographic area and how those metrics change over time. This allows us to run a professional business. It's practically impossible to do that for single family rentals. So the fourth one is inflation, right? You've got the Fed printing money. Now practically every government in the world is printing money and the more that they print, the lower the value of currencies gets. Any kind of real estate, Gold, all of these hard assets are likely to maintain their value as the value of currency declines. So we are in a world where it's extremely important to own some form of hard asset. Tax benefits. It's very likely that, let's say you invest $100,000 in someone's multifamily and they're giving you a 10% return. I'm making these numbers up. So you should expect to see a K-1 from them for $10,000, right, in a year, which is taxable. Well, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to see anything approaching that number. You might see something like $3,000 instead of 10, even though your bank account shows that $10,000 came in. Why? Because of depreciation. You're deferring that taxation into the, into the future, into the far future, uh, when the property is sold because of this wonderful magic of depreciation. And I know depreciation works for single family as well, but for multifamily, it's possible to do accelerated depreciation, not something that you can do on single family very easily. So there's a lot of taxation benefits. And here's my, the absolute favorite one, economies of scale, right? So a lot of people that work in corporate America know exactly what I mean. Vacancy impacts cash flow less. If you have a single family property and it's empty, you're at 100% vacancy. If a 200 unit has a vacancy, your vacancy only dropped by 0.5%. Marketing is more efficient because everybody's coming to the same place. Logistics are more efficient. You can have centralized uh, repair and maintenance crews. Um, it's easy to track dedicated employees that work for you full time. You can do upgrades with less impact on revenue. Why? Because even if you have a 200 unit and you're at 99% occupancy, well, there's two units empty. So you can repair them without any rent hit. And that's the beauty of the economies of scale that come with multifamily. So now, let's see what time is it. It's 4.37, so I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Um, project phases, there's four phases, phases of a multifamily. We go in, we start researching the metro. Where are the jobs? Where's the path of progress? What are the pricing trends? Then we create a team, realtors, inspectors, property managers, and contractors. Then we start looking for opportunities within the target areas that we've defined where the jobs are going and where the path of progress is. And then we start walking all the comps that are for sale so we understand where, where the market is. Once we find an appropriate opportunity, we make the first offer based on seller's financials. This offer is almost never the final number because the seller's financials may or may not be right and we do three phases of due diligence to figure out if these numbers are right. 
So we look at roofs and sewers and repairs. What's the condition of the units? Are hall carpets in good condition? What about hallways and exteriors, right? We verify their financials. Are rents really coming in? What about the competency of their staff? Are tenants delinquent? Then we start walking comparable properties on sale again to ensure that our pricing and assumptions are correct and that the property that we're buying is a, is a really good buy. And finally, based on these three pieces of due diligence, we negotiate a repair credit. Sometimes at this point, the seller refuses and the deal dies. And we start again. If it doesn't, we promote the opportunity to investors. Lawyers start creating legal LLCs to protect investors and the management team. And the, the management team works on loans with lenders and investors wire in the money so the purchase can be completed, typically within 75 days. After purchase, management makes changes to the property management team. In most cases, I must tell you, we tend to fire them. We tend to bring in a new property management team. We make upgrades to amenities, interiors, and exteriors, and that enhances tenant satisfaction so our turnover decreases and curb appeal so that the new people that come in are willing to pay a bit more. Then the management transitions out or evicts undesirable tenants, people that are not paying. We bring in better tenants with higher rents and the net operating income starts to grow. We then use the repair budget, for example, for our, uh, the property that we have in Chicago right now, we have a $750,000 repair budget. We improve the asset, we increase rents, we lower expenses, and we enhance the profitability of the asset. Each quarter, investors get checks for the cash flow, and they get financials, and they also get a property report from the management team. Now, after a while, the management runs it, typically for three to five years, these days a little bit shorter because the rents are going up faster. The property's net income at some point it can be expected to increase steadily. Typically, the NOI, reaches the exit project projections by year five or sometimes before. Once it reaches the exit projections, which we give to investors when they're investing, we put it up for sale and we complete the same within a sale within a six month time frame. Investors get their principal back along with back end profits from the sale. And that's your four step multifamily cycle. Every multifamily in the US is going to be like that. So at this point, I've reached the end of my presentation, so I want to quickly review what we just did. We talked about the two plus trillion dollar multifamily market. We now, you now know that there's these huge broad market trends. You know, America is renting more. Millennials are not interested in buying, and that's driving multifamily growth. We then talked about the six top reasons that people have used for the last hundred years to invest in apartments. And then we talked about syndication. So now if you're interested in multifamily and want to learn more, we'll talk 90, about 90 seconds on the next steps. If you want to know about a current multifamily opportunity, including a high def video tour, here's the URL that you should go to. And I'll also give the URL to you through uh, chat. www.financial-attunement.com. Don't forget the dash slash next. So if you're interested in next steps, I highly recommend you check this out. You learn a lot about multifamily by watching the video and reading the documents. You can also email us to get on our opportunity list and we'll happily include you. And as we come up with properties like, like these, we'll, we'll send that out to you. Or if you're really interested and want to chat with us, here's our phone number. Please write it down, 510-972-3641, and we'll give you more information. So. That was it for multifamily. Uh, thank you for your time. This is a good time to ask questions if you have any. Any questions from the audience? Okay, um, let's see. I'll give you guys another 10 or 15 seconds for those that are not the fastest typists in the world. Wow, I did a much better job than last time, no questions. Um, Karen, um, looks like I'm done. Would you like to take over? I can hand over control to you? Yes. Okay, let me do that. Hang on. How do I do this? It's been a while. Make another attendee to present for Karen. And, um, yes.
Okay, hand it over. Okay. I think you've got to share your screen, Karen. Yep. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. I can. Okay. Did anybody have any questions, Neil? Uh, no, not at this time. So you're you're set. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Perfect. Okay. So um, Neil had mentioned that investors can use a self-directed IRA to invest in multifamily. So now I'm just going to go through um, the basic introduction of what a self-directed retirement plan is, the basics of investing in non-traditional assets within your retirement plan. So Next Generation Trust Services, we're a third-party administrator. Um, we have experience and expertise in you know, record-keeping, administrating, and allowing our clients to invest in their retirement funds into allowable types of assets. We're not a bank. We're not a financial planner. We're not a brokerage house. Um, like I said, we are neutral third-party professionals. We educate our clients. We're really big on educating. That's why you know, we're having this webinar so that everybody's educated on um, options to develop a self-directed retirement plan. Um, our disclaimer, we never endorse, we don't recommend, we don't sell any products, we don't give any invest investment advice, we just offer education to our clients and their advisors on non-traditional investment options that they can keep in with their, their retirement plan so they can diversify their portfolio. Again, we don't review merits or legitimacy of any investments. We don't endorse or recommend any companies, products, services, or investments. Um, so you need to do your due diligence on any investments that you're looking at. Um, we're not a fiduciary as defined by the IRC, ERISA, and any other applicable federal, state, or local laws. And all this information is just for educational purposes only. So what is a self-directed IRA? that allows you to invest in non-traditional assets within your retirement plan. Um, investment into non-traditional assets have been around since the inception of IRA accounts. Investments that keep your funds tax advantage. And a self-directed IRA account is no different than a regular IRA account you currently have. Establishing an account with a company like Next Generation just opens up a whole new world for allowable non-traditional investments. So what types of plans can be self-directed? Well, we have a traditional IRA for tax-deferred investing, a Roth IRA for tax-free investing, a SEPT for self-employed people, SIMPLE for small businesses. Um, you can also have a qualified plan, a 401k. You can also use education savings, a Coverdell and health savings accounts as well. Um, you have several options for funding a self-directed IRA. You can contribute new personal funds into your account. You could transfer, if you currently have a traditional IRA, you can transfer all or a portion of it into a self-directed IRA. If you have a 401k from a previous employer that's just kind of sitting there, you can roll over those funds into a self-directed IRA so that you can take advantage of uh, investing in non-traditional assets. Or you could do a conversion to move funds from a tax-deferred IRA into a Roth IRA for tax-free investing. Um, this slide is just the 2015 maximum contribution uh, limits for traditional and Roth. Um, so a typical person can contribute 5,500 of their personal funds annually into a traditional or a Roth. If you're 50 or older, you can contribute an extra $1,000 a year, and then the rest of the, uh, the uh, contribution limits are there. Um, there are restrictions on investments. Um, we have prohibited transactions. 
also you're not allowed to invest your self-directed IRA into life insurance policies, um, collectibles, you can't invest in antiques, rugs, alcoholic beverages, you can't be a wine collector, you can't uh, invest in collectible art or stamp collections. And disqualified persons are your, the current IRA holder, the IRA holder spouse, your ascendants, your descendants and their spouses, any fiduciaries of the account, any business partners, and any people that provide service to the account. The, po the possibilities for investing into your self-directed IRA, you can invest in real estate, you can do multifamily, you can do fix and flips with your self-directed IRA, mortgage notes, tax lien certificates, you can invest in startup companies, private placements, hedge funds, uh, you can invest in LLCs, commodities and futures, precious metals, unsecured loans, international adventures. It's a whole world of non-traditional assets that you can invest in with your self-directed IRA. So, but before you invest, it's important that you establish a self-directed IRA account, transfer funds, at least enough for a good faith deposit into your next gen account before you locate an investment property. And we do understand that real estate deadlines are tight and they need to be met. And um, next generation, our processing time is typically two business days. Once we have completed documentation, the transfer process from your current custodian could take up to 30 business days. So all of these deadlines you need to take into consideration when you know you want to open a self-directed IRA. It's not something that's going to be turned over and open overnight. So you know you have to establish the account and then be ready to move quickly. So this is um, an example of a typical real estate example. So you would establish and fund your self-directed IRA account, at least enough money for a good faith deposit on the property. So if you needed to put um, a $2,000 deposit, you can you know, fund your account with $2,000 of your personal funds just so that you have enough to put that deposit down. Um, locate an investment property, do your due diligence, um, you know, invest wisely. Negotiate the purchase contract in the name of the IRA. So the on all the real estate documentation, um, it would be next generation, TS for trust services, FBO for the benefit of John Smith, IRA, and then the IRA number. Um, you would submit an a, approved contract to next generation trust services with the deposit instruction. We would execute the contract and submit the deposit on your behalf on your IRA's behalf. Um, you would do your due diligence, all your home inspections, your title search, all that stuff. Submit the approved closing documents with the escrow instructions to NextGen, and Next Generation Trust will execute the closing documents and fund the escrow. And your IRA now owns property. So all the income will come into your self-directed IRA, and all the expenses for the property will flow out of your self-directed IRA. Um, I also have an example of how a tax lien works. So if you were to locate a tax auction, um, you would send back up information to Next Generation Trust. You would register for the auction in the name of your IRA. So like I said, Next Generation TS, FBO, Don Smith, IRA number one, two, three. You fill out the Next Generation Trust purchase documents. Um, you indicate the different check denominations that you wish to bring to the tax auction. We would execute the documents and send the checks to you. Um, you would attend the tax lien auction, bid as normal, pay with the funds sent from the IRA, and then any unused funds will be sent back to Next Generation Trust and returned into your self-directed IRA. Um, I do also have an example of you know, how you can invest your self-directed IRA into a private placement, if that's something that you're interested in, whether it's an established one or a new one. 
Um, but, you know, those are pretty much the basics, but, you know, you have to do your due diligence and, you know, you have to open the account first and allow enough time, you know, because those contract deadlines can be tight so that you can get the funding and, you know, get your investment property into your self-directed IRA. So if um, anybody has any questions on uh, self-directed IRAs, there's our website, www dot nextgenerationtrust.com. Um, there's my email, Karen A, nextgenerationtrust.com. Our phone number, 973-533-1880. Um, you know, you guys are welcome to visit our website. Uh, has a lot of good information. You know, if you want further information, you want to discuss it further, don't hesitate to email me, call me. I'd be more than happy to discuss it with you. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions from the audience? Feel free to chat to plug them into the chat window. Uh, nope. Karen, we're both awesome. We didn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yep. yep. So, all right. So. I see a lot of attendees. No questions at this time. All right, folks. So that's that's our event. Um, if you're interested in opening a self-directed IRA, please contact Karen. If you're interested in multifamily, please uh, contact uh, Financial Attunement. Once again, if you'd like to know more about multifamily, go to financial-attunement, A-T-T-U-N-E-M-E-N-T, -E -E slash next. And that will give you the next steps. And, and you can also watch a video of a multifamily there. So we'll end the event. Thank you, Karen, so much for, for helping us organize this event. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Neil. All right. Bye-bye, okay. all.